Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Supporting a Healthy Lifestyle brought to you from the Kansas Avenue Health Ministries Department. Today, we have a special topic, the truth about sugar. I am so excited to learn why I can't eat my donuts. I love donuts. But Dr. Walsh is going to bring to us why the truth about sugar and how it affects our life and our lifestyles and our brain. Let us pray to open. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us here today and everyone under the sound of my voice to hear a word from you, to hear a word from your servant, Dr. Walsh. Help us to have open minds and open ears to hear what he has to say and incorporate that into our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So let me introduce Dr. Eric Walsh. Now, Dr. Walsh was born in Connecticut, Hanford, Connecticut. He is a graduate of the University of Miami School of Medicine and of Loma Linda University School of Public Health, where he received his master's and doctorate degrees in public health. His most important education experience was actually his time at Oakwood University. He has served two presidents of the United States of America, George Bush and Barack Obama as an advisor on HIV AIDS. Dr. Walsh has served at several churches as an associate pastor, and he is now practicing physician at health and a healthcare administrator. He is passionate about educating people on ways to improve their mental, physical, and spiritual health. He has taken his passion for better health to speak around the world. He has co-founded Slave Food Project, a non-for-profit that focuses on encouraging health and wellness by providing essential tools needed to live a better, healthy lifestyle. Let's welcome Dr. Eric Walsh. Hello. Hello. How yes. are you guys doing today? Great, great. It's good to have you here again. We love having your presentations. Good to be on. And, um, uh, you know, this time it's nice and warm here in Connecticut. So, um, it's, it's very different than probably the last time I was on. Uh, so we are appreciating it, able to get some sunshine and some warmth um, and glad to be able to participate. And I um, still love, of course, uh, my brothers and sisters at the Kansas Avenue Church. And so uh, good to be able to reconnect. We have a really heavy topic today. Yes. <laughs> I know. I like why? This is one of the ones that probably affects us all. And that's partly why it is such um, such a difficult topic to actually uh, deal with. Um, so I am, I'm, I'm going to have to share my screen. Let me see if I can pull up the PowerPoint. Hold on one second. No problem. Uh, While you're doing that, I'll just give a shout out to, Doc, to Ellen Adwards, who has joined us here on Facebook as our first uh, person in the chat. Everyone, feel free to jump in the chat and post your questions. We're happy to address them as best that we can uh, during the presentation. Okay. And so, I'm a, all right, let me see. I think I can share my screen. Let me let me see. I haven't done this on StreamYard in a while. Oh, okay. Share screen. Uh, share screen. Can you see my other screen in the background yet? Not yet. All right, it's asking for like permission. I've never seen it do that before. Hold on. Yes, you'll have to give uh, permission. StreamYard is uh, unique. Uh, yeah, I've never seen this before. <laughs> Ah, uh, no problem. Uh, um, so Google Chrome. Uh, I think I got it. Okay. 
Well, folks, so we'll be waiting uh, for Dr. Wash to, to go ahead and get his PowerPoint up. You know, sugar is something that we have in almost everything we eat, right? So we find that in our fruits, our juices, those are the extra sugars. We find that in our, some of our grains, you know, like pasta will convert to sugar. So sugar is something that we are going to be exposed to probably every day in different ways. And our body uses those differently. So that's why this topic on sugar is so important because it also affects our moods and things like that. So Dr. Wash will, of course, um, bring more information on that. How's that going there, Dr. Walsh? I think we're good. Sounds good. Can you see the, the slides, Kirin? Oh, it should happen in a second or two. Yes. So I see everything. Okay. Um, I, think I think you can go screen. to presenter's view. How's that? Right. So I see the slides and they're very small. So I think if you go there to the top uh, left-hand corner, I think they're at presenter's view. We might see them a little bit larger. Let me see. All, right, yeah, all the way on. top to your ribbon. Yeah. All right, let me try again. Let me do it this okay, way. no problem. Did that work? Um, no, not yet. I'll, I'll wait for our host to help us out there. But yes, yeah, so at the top ribbon, the ribbon there at the top where it has all the different little icons, um, there should be one that says presenter's view. How's that? Yes, yeah, so we can see the um, the slides, but they're very small. We see your whole uh, screen. So I think you're sharing the screen. Are you able to go up right where your first slide is on, I think it should maybe be your right hand, your left hand side, I think it is. There's a little icon, it should say presenter's view. Yeah, that's what exactly what I did already. I did that twice oh. already. Oh, okay. For some reason it's not, it's just not, coming up big in your I don't know how to make it come up big because I can see it mm -hmm. here but it's not it's not going into presenter view in your in there so let me see what I can do so here. right there where your your mm -hmm. cursor is so I press this and it, it's not working oh it's not working yeah um okay well me, we'll we'll go with it I can make this bigger okay do that. I hate to do it this way because it's not gonna be nearly as good but But it'll work. Yeah, yes, there we go. That, that'll work. And I can see it. I'm sorry. I, I don't know. It normally doesn't do that. But it's not, also never asked me for permission. So, all right. I think you can also do play from the start. I, think. Uh, that, I tried that too. Oh, you anyway. tried that too. This, this, this works. <laughs> this is perfect. This is good. Yes. Yeah, this will work. All right. So, we're going to talk through this. And this is really almost like a part one, a part of two parts because there's so much science and history on sugar and once you understand that you realize sugar is probably one of the most abused substances on the planet um and to your point about the donuts janet um we are all we have all been indoctrinated and um um sensitized to really liking sh processed sugars mm -hmm. and in some ways it's actually a frightening thing because in many ways we don't have a choice um, they add a lot of sugar to baby formulas over the years, um, baby foods. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the baby's palate, a child's palate in the uterus is actually partially determined by what the mother's eating. So when you add all of this together, so if your mother's eating donuts when, you're, when she's pregnant, you may more like donuts when you are born, um, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've all been inundated with sugar. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. Um, it crosses the placenta. Most people don't even understand sugar. Uh, so we're going to yeah. talk about what sugar really is and is not uh, when we talk about sugar as a negative 
health determinant. So there's a lot to unpack. And that's why I say, I mean, we may have to come back when we can do some of the more heavy health side of it, because I do want to give a background of sugar so that we understand sugar a little better. Excellent. In order to do that, I want to start with a Bible verse and a word of prayer. So Proverbs chapter 23, verses one through three says this, when thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee and put a knife to your throat if you be a man given to appetite. Oh. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Mercy. They are deceitful meat. And that is a uh, uh, very <laughs> clear <with the> passage <laughs> of scripture. And we're going to unpack the scripture yeah. as we get into the science as well. So let's pray. Yeah. Uh, Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We thank you, Lord, for your truth and for your um, health message, Lord, that we are trying to all be better at uh, following so that we would be better witnesses for you. Now lead us, Lord, as we talk about sugar, lead us, guide us, and help us to really be able to formulate um, a plan to live better based on these truths. Um, forgive us where we have erred, Lord, and we thank you for your mercy. Give us strength now to not only learn truth, but to apply it to our lives. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So um, this is the verse we just read. Um, and uh, the verse two is very profound. And put a knife to your throat if you be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. So if you look at Proverbs 25, 27, there's another really good verse on sugar. <laughs> it says, it is not good to eat much honey. For so men to for so men to search their own glory is not glory. So I'm gonna show these two verses we just went over in the amplified version of the Bible. Let me tell you something. Before I do health talks, I I want to establish from scripture that what we're talking about is spiritually relevant. And I think these two verses do that. There are many others. These two verses do that. And why do I do that? Because many people misconstrue the purpose of our health message. All of the health benefits we get from our health message, as important as they are, they're secondary to the fact that our health message gives us clarity of mind so that we will be able to withstand last day deceptions, mm -hmm. so that we will be able to stand spiritually. Um, in my talks, I talk a lot about the frontal lobe and what happens when the frontal lobe is attacked by alcohol, cocaine, entertainment. Sugar is one of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and when the brain is under this attack, we can't follow the edicts the scripture gives. And one of them is to be sober, be vigilant. But your adversary, the devil, walketh about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We are to be sober and vigilant, to watch unto prayer, the Bible says. You can't do that if your mind is messed up. In fact, in another proverb, I should have put this text in here too, but Solomon also says, uh, blessed is your land when your princes eat for strength and not for drunkenness, right? So you can eat for drunkenness. And we know sugar can do that. So much to unpack. Um, and I'm going to write notes as I think of stuff I need to say that I, that I, so I won't forget. I'm actually going to write stuff down no problem. and lows. Okay. So, so let's look at this, these verses really quickly in these other Bible, uh, 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 um, amplified version of the Bible. It says here in 23, one and one through three of Proverbs, when you sit down to dine with a ruler, consider carefully what is set before you, for you will put a knife to your throat if you are a man of great appetite. In other words, if you're not careful, it's literally like you're putting a knife to your own throat. Mm -hmm. Version makes it like, let's put a knife to your throat, like stop yourself. The Amplified, probably better translated that literally, it's like you're killing yourself. And he says here, do not desire his delicacies, for it is deceptive food offered to you with questionable motives. And we're gonna show you that this Bible verse is 100% accurate even today that we are still under questionable motives by the king at whose table we sit. So prophetically, whose table are we sitting at? We're sitting at the table of the king of Babylon. We are told to come out of Babylon. Mm -hmm. How do we know that this is a good, good uh, analogy? Because where do we see this practiced in scripture? It's in the book of Daniel chapter one, when Daniel and the three Hebrew boys sit with um, at Nebuchadnezzar's table, they refuse to eat the king's meat, they refuse to drink the king's wine. They eat pulse instead, which is lentils and vegetables. So we have literally, biblically, we have the example that this verse was carried out. In, and we are prophetically now, um, spiritually, at the table of Babylon. 
So if the, the, the Babylon of the day wants to control us, one of the ways that Babylon will do this is through food, right? All right, so that's the that's most of the spiritual part of this. This is a, a Proverbs 25 in the Amplified Version. It is not good to eat much honey, nor is it glorious to seek one's own glory. Deep. Wow. In other yes. words, when we eat too much sugar, it's like we are feeding our own selfishness and pride. Mm. Right, because we're they, many of you know Dr. James Kyle, great guy, one of my mentors, a physician and pastor, and Dr. James Kyle. I think he's still still preaching at the uh, Glendale Adventist Church in L.A. outside of L.A. He came to Rubido many moons ago. Um, I think Mark Woodson was still pastor of Rubido when he came, and they, Dr. Kyle preached a sermon, and he said something that, that I use all the time. So I make sure to give him credit. He said. Mm -hmm. Your body will conspire to kill you. If you wow. give everything you crave and desire, the cookies, the ice cream, the donuts, the cake, the pizza, the French fries, the tater tots, I can go on and on and on. If you give yourself everything you desire, your very body will desire to kill you. This is why the apostle Paul says in Romans chapter eight and verse one, he says, oh, who shall deliver me? From the body, or actually, it's Roman. It's the last verse of Romans chapter seven. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Our own bodies do that. So, how does that happen? So, let's look at it. Well, let's get into sugar now. Let's really look at sugar mm -hmm. um, and look at what it is that sugar does. And because we're in this phase, I can actually make things bigger in real time. Normally, I can't do that, um, so I'm gonna do that. So, U.S. sugar consumption. This is where how sugar consumption has increased in the United States over the last couple hundred years. I want you to see how staggering this is. You see that there's a slight dip here. Um, uh, you know, here, you can see the slight dip. But overall, there's been a massive increase in the amount of sugar consumption. This is sugar consumption per pound per year to the point we get up over 100 pounds of sugar a year. Well, at one time, we were down around seven pounds of sugar in a year. That is staggering and relevant because when you look at it, um, this is not, it is not pro uh, directly proportional to everyone. And uh, my good friend, Dr. Columbus Batiste and partner in the Slave Food Project, um, you know, we always try and highlight how these differences apply to black people and how uh, food is, relates back to slavery and how it enslaves today. So you can see here, added sugar intake. This is overall, and look at African-Americans, overall our intake has increased more over the years. There's a drop, but you can see, uh, you know, we disproportionately intake more sugar. This is just up to 2010, but it doesn't matter. It shows you that whatever is going on with sugar, whatever bad things sugar does, it actually disproportionately is going to affect African Americans, right? So how does that pan out in disease? We're going to talk about disease more, but it pans out in disease this way: obesity. Uh, if you look at the rate of percentage um, of African-American males and females versus white males and females, it's high for everyone. Don't get me wrong. But obviously, this is you can see here that childhood obesity is worse. Fatty liver disease is actually a little better. Um, and this one is probably because of um, alcohol consumption. Diabetes prevalence, though, almost almost double, not quite. Hypertension, significantly higher. End stage renal disease. This is kidney disease significantly higher, four times higher. And it's interesting, it's four times higher even though um, diabetes prevalence is not four times higher. So our liver, our kidneys are disproportionately affected. There's some who argue that some of the things that happened in the Middle Passage um, during the slave trade, as we're gonna talk about in a second, actually um, self kind of selected, um, naturally selected, well, actually unnaturally selected for kidney disease in African-Americans. And of course, death from cardiovascular disease like heart attacks and strokes. And you can see we are much higher there as well. So all of these things correlate back to the fact that we take in more sugar um, in, in, as added sugar. And uh, of course, we have all of these extra diseases. So remember that the, the verse of the scripture says that it's deceitful and you've got to question their motives is the way that the Amplified Version translates that text. So here's what they did initially. They actually came at us by making us think that sugar was good for you. That in fact, if you nibble on a cookie about a half an hour before your lunch, you're going to lose weight. Sugar keeps your energy up and your appetite down. 
Sugar can be the willpower you need to undereat. You see this? And so, no, I, I yeah, obviously they also um, kind of went after African Americans in, in this in this one, but they had this idea that if you eat sugar, you can actually decrease your appetite, and that is not true. If you want to do what they're saying, you wouldn't eat processed sugars. That we're going to talk more about. Um, you would be eating a whole plant-based foods full of fiber, which would lend itself to longer satiation. Um, let me show you one more of these, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Here's an it's interesting um, uh, uh, commercials here, uh, uh, advertisements. You can see here, pure pleasure, seven up. <laughs> seven up is so pure, so wholesome, nothing does it like seven up. They're giving, they're telling you to give you a baby seven up back then. That's where it came from. You know who else did this? The tobacco industry, trying to convince you that cigarettes were good for you. And I would argue that there are some folk doing that now with other things, even like marijuana. So where's the global sugar supply the highest? In the United States. And this is not by accident. And you can see all around the world, nobody comes close to the U.S. There's some high supplies in, in, in parts of uh, Europe, like Switzerland, where they make all that chocolate. And a couple spots here, Cuba, of course, with all of its sugar production capabilities. New Zealand seems to be a little bit high. But overall, the United States dominates the world. We are the kings of sugar in terms of sugar production and sugar supply. So there's an endless supply. And part of that is you can throw in um, high fructose corn syrup. And what you have to understand about that is that high fructose corn syrup, you, you can throw that in because what they're really doing to us with high fructose corn syrup is they're taking corn and subsidizing, government subsidizing corn so that there's too much corn. They've figured out how to turn that corn into corn oil and high fructose corn syrup. Those are two things that come out of that. But high fructose corn syrup is probably more dangerous than regular sugar and cheaper to make because of the fact that the government subsidizes it. So we have a lot of sugar, a lot of high fructose corn syrup. You see less of it now. People have got hip to it. It's dangerous. But still, we are living in a time of some pretty bad stuff. So I would be remiss, and, and I don't want to um, uh, not continue the legacy, the amazing legacy that um, that um, Dr. Batista and I have of, of tying these things back to slavery. So I want to do that today. So sugar fed slavery. And there are great articles online. You can read whole books. I'll show you in a second that point to the fact that sugar actually fed slavery. So <laughs> sugar fed the slave trade. And sugar actually enslaves people. Um, the demand for sugar, as the more sugar was produced, the more the demand for sugar grew. So the more slavery was actually needed. Um, it was one of the key crops in the West Indies. Um, and of course, in Louisiana and the um, and that whole uh, um, part of the Gulf Coast um, and up into Louisiana. So sugar fed the slave trade. And I, I can show you some of that. Um, this is a great article by Kilal Muhammad, and it's the sugar that saturates the American diet has a barbaric history as the white gold that fuels slavery. And you can see, you know, we eat all of these sugary things. Many of the people, you know, many of us grew up eating these things when I was growing up, you know, to have a Twix or a Baby Ruth or a Kit Kat was like the top of the mountain. And in essence, it was like we were eating a, a drug, um, anything. Let me say this about addiction, because we're going to talk about sugar as an addictive substance. Anything that changes your mood can become habit forming. So when you feel bad and you reach for that Snickers bar or that Kit Kat, and you see how the commercials do for Snickers, you know, you have Joe Pesci, angry person or whoever it is, and then they eat a Snickers, Snickers bar and they go back to normal. That is a statement of addiction that those commercials are pushing. And not just Joe Pesci, they've used, I think some of the other celebrities they use for those commercials. I should put a slide up on it. Uh, but that change in mood it's something you're going to go want to go back to. Um, so when you when you do when you're talking about sugar and its addictive properties, um, this is that commercial shows it, and it's because when we bite into a Kit Kat after a bad day and you feel better, the next time you feel bad, guess what you're going to want to bite into, and so it can become habit forming, and actually even you could argue arrest emotional uh, maturity development because you blunt your emotional response to things with sugar. So you feel better even though you're supposed to process the pain. Don't miss that. That's what crack addicts do. That's what alcoholics do. So do sugar holics, sugar addicts. All right. 
So the United States, this is from that article, the United States makes about 9 million tons of sugar annually, ranking it sixth in global production. Yet we are the number one in supply. How is that possible? Because we not only do we make all that sugar, we still import sugar. The United States sugar industry receives as much as $4 billion in annual subsidies. I hope everybody gets that. While we are talking about how all the problems America has, that poor school systems, um, lack of housing, all the things we talk about, $4 billion used to subsidize the sugar industry to make more sugar that is addicting. It's, how do they subsidize it? In the form of price supports, guaranteed crop loans, um, guaranteed crop loans, um, where am I? Tariffs and regulated imports of foreign sugar, which by some estimates is about half the price per pound of domestic sugar. So if if, if, if they took this away, you could make the argument that the price of sugar would double. And that would make people consume less, right? If the more expensive a food is, the less people consume it. Louisiana's sugarcane industry by itself is worth about $3 billion, generating about 16,400 jobs. So it's very easy for the government to justify subsidizing. They say, listen, we need to subsidize it because we need the jobs. We need to be able to make people um, able to work. And this is a food that's needed. So sorry, because because we're not in presentation mode. This, these are looking really bad. But... Here are two really good books. This one um, by Mark Aronson and Marina Budos, Sugar Changed the World, A Story of Magic, Spice, Slavery, Freedom, and Science. Um, and this one here, Walter Johnson, Soul by Soul, Life Inside the Antebellum Slave Market, both of which tie high sugar consumption back to slavery. Sugar would not be in use as it is in the world today if it wasn't for slavery. Um, and slavery would never have proliferated the way it did if it wasn't for sugar. Sugar-fed slavery and slavery fed sugar. Um, so when you eat sugar, you have to understand you really are are, are kind of um, a part of what happened. And here's the trade. So this is the truth about sugar. That's the name of our talk. So it's not just about the bad effects of sugar in when you eat it, it's the bad effects of sugar in, in history. And you look at the slave trade, they sent slaves to the Americas and they were in Cuba. There's the island of Jamaica. There's a uh, Hispaniola with uh, Puerto Rico, uh, I'm sorry, with Dominican Republic and Haiti, Puerto Rico's over here. All those countries had uh, sugar plantations, but so did when you go in here up into Louisiana um, and the Gulf Coast of the United States and all that sugar. So one of the things that was sent across along with tobacco and cotton from those areas was sugar. So a ship came full of slaves, dropped off the slaves, sold the slaves, picked up the sugar, tobacco and the cotton and went to Europe. And in Europe, they processed it and manufactured it. So they had jobs in Europe. Um, the textiles, the rum and manufactured goods went back to Africa to support the colonies and sell in the colonies and then come around. They bring some of that stuff, of course, over to the Americas as well. So slavery drove this engine. It would not have been possible without slavery. So let's jump into sugar. So this is sucrose. This is table sugar. And when we talk about sugar, this is really what most people are thinking of. Um, there's two parts to it. It's a disaccharide, as you can see here and um, it has a simple bond in the middle. Um, and let me jump down because I don't wanna to get too heavy into that. I will, but I do wanna show you is that what is good is glucose. Glucose is the, is the energy source of the universe uh, and of the world. Somehow God did that. Uh, you see how many carbon, you see all the carbon uh, atoms here. Um, you can see in, in both of these carbon, the fact that it has these carbon atoms makes it uh, organic. So when you do like organic chemistry, but glucose is a hexagonal, so it's six-sided, um, but has the same number of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen as the bad aspect of sucrose, which is fructose. But it is shaped um, like a pentagon, like a, a, a pentagram. So when you go back up here, you can actually see the sh this is glucose, this is fructose. What you have to understand that what is bad is fructose. And I don't have time to get into it today, but when you eat honey, as much as we love honey, honey is two fructose, no glucose. So it's not something that's why the Bible directly says, do not eat too much of it because the fructose is really the problem. The glucose is the energy source of the universe. As I said, the brain can only function, only function on, um, on glucose. So glucose crosses the blood brain barrier and it goes to the brain, which disproportionately uses that energy compared to the rest of the body for the brain to do the work it needs to do. So fructose is where we have problems. So how 
does this thing work? How does sugar become addicting? Well, this is food. As you can see, food really dopamine is released in the brain based on food. You guys see that? The orange balls. They hit the receptors on this side. And what happens is it sends a signal down this side of the what's called a post. This is the presynaptic nerve, postsynaptic nerve. It hits here, sends a signal of pleasure. That's what dopamine does, right? I don't have time to get into it, but so dopamine does. That's why food does it, sex does it, water does it, um, music can do it, naturally release dopamine without any chemical uh, interference. Food, of course, is made of chemicals. So it's a little different than water or some of the other things. Like gambling will release some dopamine and adrenaline. But look at what cocaine does. See, it just floods the inside of here. And that's why you become addicted to cocaine, because now you have all of these orange balls sending pleasure signals through the brain. It is a high euphoria and can literally cause you to um can literally cause you to you know become addicted. And rats, if given a simple cage with one thing of food and one thing of water and one thing of cocaine water. The rats will click on the cocaine water until they die, right? So um, cocaine is highly addictive. But look at when you compare brains here. This is a normal brain. You see the red in there? The red in there is that there's high dopamine, which means you have a normal pleasure and interest. Um, this is cocaine. You see how similar the cocaine user's brain is to the sugar user? This is the truth about sugar. It changes your brain. Literally changes the neurophysiology, neuroanatomy of the brain, like cocaine does. Here's what they say. Regular consumption of sugar will reduce your natural ability to experience pleasure. And so that means it takes more for you to have pleasure. So you may, you have to eat more sugar to get the same effect. You've got to, you know, that means that in some ways, sugar can be a gateway drug, um, as, ca as can caffeine. So when you think about all the kids growing up drinking lattes and all this stuff at Starbucks and McDonald's and stuff, they're literally priming their brains that when if they ever try marijuana, cocaine, heroin, opiates, they're actually probably going to be more likely to become addicted than if they had not grown up on all this other stuff. So that's part of what's happening. Dr. Lustig is a guy, Dr. Batista and I have talked about him a lot. He's a very interesting fellow, very bright guy. Uh, we don't agree with him on everything, but he, he does a lot of great work on, on sugar. And let me just read what he says. This is from his page. That's a, uh, that's a picture of him from that blog page I looked at. I'm just going to read this, give you an idea of what's going on here. Apart from its calories, sugar is bad for two reasons. It turns into fat in the liver. That all by itself is important. And like I said, that is a whole talk I could do by itself. And it mucks up the mitochondria, the little energy burning factories inside each cell. Both of these results in a process known as insulin resistance which leads to chronic disease. Specifically, most of you know that it leads to diabetes, insulin resistance, uh, because you, your pancreas keeps making the insulin, but it has nowhere to work. Um, and apart from its calories, fat is bad for one reason. When it doesn't burn in these problem, when it doesn't burn in those problem mitochondria, it can make proteins that can cause more inflammation and more disease. And we know that in fact, um, inflammation, COVID is a disease of inflammation. Why is COVID do so well in America? And we've talked about this on Slave Food Project. It's did so well in America because America's a hyper inflamed. Stress inflames you. Food can inflame you. Lack of sleep can inflame you. You throw COVID on top of that. And it was like we were dry brush um, and COVID was gasoline and a lighter. So, um, you know, all of these things can cause you to have more inflammation, which, of course, is going to cause you to have more um, disease. He says, so fat is bad and sugar is worse. The combination of fat and sugar together is by far the worst. That's called the Western diet. And so when you look at it, we take a donut. We talked about donuts before. Um, and let, so let's break down what a donut is. A donut is high amounts of fat with high amounts of sugar that jams up the mitochondria. And because the sugar, I'm going to go all the way back up here since I can do that in this mode. Let me show you the picture again. Because the sugar... Um, is not the glucose side, but this fructose side. When they put when they put this this in here, this breaks off, um, and you get this. Fructose goes into the liver and become and the liver produces fat. The liver actually becomes fatty, um, and the fat itself blocks the insulin receptor on your muscle cells so that you can't store sugar as what we call glycogen. And so it's a major problem. Because now you're eating fat in the burger, you're eating fat in the cheese on the burger, which is all deadly all by itself. But then the bun is made of white bread, 
And that white bread is also just going to break down the simple sugar in your body and cause more of this, this problem. Um, you throw in the white potatoes from the French fries that are fried in oil, and you start to see why we have so much disease. We He calls it the Western diet. We uh, It's also called the SAD, the standard American diet. And you start to see that this, 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 this diet is designed to cause disease. And I hope you guys are getting that. So when you go back to scripture, what does the Bible say? You're not supposed to eat the fat of an animal. It says you're not supposed to eat the blood of an animal. It says you're not, and then it tells, warns you about honey and delicacies and dainties. And you start to see that the health message um, really predates the science, clearly, uh, our modern science, but was spot on. If you can um, um, be temperate in these things and eliminate some of them from your diet, you're actually going to do better and live longer. And um, that's kind of where we are now. So just to give you a better picture of it, this is a bit of a... Um, um, of a of a you know a little bit of a diagram for it increased liver fat content plasma, APOC three and hypertriglyceridemia. So people go to the doctor, they have high triglycerides. They put you on an anti triglyceride medication, a statin for your cholesterol on this. And what you need to do is cut the cholesterol out of your diet and the sugar out of your diet because the fructose. And remember what they we started making because we had too much corn in this country and they needed to find a way to use it. High fructose corn syrup. So that comes in here and really makes you insulin insensitive, causes diabetes, inflammation, and all of these different diseases. And it is a sad thing because most of you, if you're like me, you were literally raised on foods that would cause these problems. So just to go through a few more things, then we're going to take some questions. Like I said, it's too much to hit probably everything today, but let me go through some more slides and then we'll take questions. And a study published in 2014 in JAMA Internal Medicine Dr. Hugh and his colleagues found an association between a high sugar diet and a greater risk of heart from heart disease. Over the course of the 15 year study, people who got 17% to 21% of their calories from added sugar had a 38% higher risk of dying from cardiovascular disease. Remember cardiovascular disease, heart attacks and strokes compared with those who consumed 8% of their calories from added sugar. So that all by itself is pretty, pretty profound. How do you find the hidden sugars? Well, I don't know why you guys can see this one, but it's in. You read the label. The label's gonna say brown sugar, corn sweetener, corn syrup, uh, fruit juice concentrates. Fruit juice is almost worse than sh than soda, because you strip away the fiber from the fructose in the fruit, and you're left with just fructose again. And so when you drink it, it actually really speeds up um, uh, obesity and some of these problems. Fruit sugar, high fructose corn syrup, honey, in invert sugar, malt sugar, molasses. Serum sugar molecules ending in os, and so you add dextrose, fructose, glucose, lactose, maltose, sucrose. All of that is just sugar in the stuff. So they have a bunch of ways to put it in. Name it differently so that you don't see how much sugar is really in the product. Um, and of course, it again, it's going to make you feel better. It's going to make and it is addicting, uh, but it will cause all kinds of disease. Sugar. Um, I won't get too much into it today, but I, let me just mention that it, it lowers your immune system. When sugar, and I should have put a slide on there on this, it, it, it binds to your white blood cells, puts them to sleep, blocks uh, vitamin C from getting into your white blood cells so that they're not as effective or accurate. So sugar lowers your blood, your, your immune system. And you know this because diabetics get really bad infections and often have to lose body parts if they get infections in their, usually like starts in the toes and can move all the way up the legs and people keep getting amputations. Sugar, um, elevated sugar levels in from diabetes damages the eyes, causes retinopathy. Number one cause of blindness is diabetes. Diabetes also because it lowers the immune system. I mean, sugar because it lowers the immune system. And sugar because it is a toxin itself, which I won't get into today, actually can increase risk of cancers as well. Um, uh, you know, so there's a lot, you know, uh, to it. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why people like sugar and foods in the first place. One of the things here, I, um, that's really fascinating is that we have now discovered the connection of the sugar and the and the um, and what we call the microbiome of the gut, where there are lots and lots of bacteria, good bacteria. Uh, let me just read this. this is from one of the articles on that. It has been well documented the gut and the gut microflora play may, many essential roles in relation to maintaining health and wellness. Firstly, the gut microflora are essential for the function of the immune system. 70% of immune tissue is located in the digestive system as gut-associated lymphoid tissue or GALT. In addition, the balance of flora within the colon plays an essential role in stimulating and supporting the normal function of the GALT, as well as modulating inflammation and supporting the integrity of the digestive lining. So if you don't have the right combination or, 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 or percentages of, of gut bacteria, 
you get more inflammation. Um, you get um, the lining of the of the of your gut becomes broken, so that toxins can go from your colon into your bloodstream and cause problems. So look at this. Recent research has shown that the balance of gut flora is strongly associated with an individual's ability to lose or gain weight, and certain flora are related to an increased risk of obesity. Higher sugar intake has a significant effect on the microbiome. Number one, it can stimulate the overgrowth of undesirable bacteria and microbes. Studies have shown that high fructose intake is related to an overall decrease in bacterial diversity and an increase in the firmicutes bacteroides ratio, which is associated with increased weight gain and obesity. So sugar isn't just making you gain weight because of its calories. It's making you gain weight because it changes who you are. Some are now calling the, the um, microbiome, all of these bacteria that line the inside of your colon, they're starting to call it like another organ system. They're calling it like another person inside of you. They call all kinds of names for it. But the reality is if those things get, de if, it, if it gets off, it makes it very difficult to lose weight. Um, and sugar, therefore, not only can put on weight because it's calories, empty calories, no nutrition in white table sugar and what they add to most of our foods. Um, and the reason they add it to our foods, let me just make this commercial is because it's a preservative. It's a bulking agent. Um, obviously it works for taste. Um, and so there's a lot of reasons they use it. Um, but once it's in your food, hidden in your food, it messes up your gut microbiome. And when it messes up your gut microbiome, it then makes it harder for you to lose weight. So it's, it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So here's one, um, dietary sugar and body weight, a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized control trials and cohorts. Large amount of clinical studies have found consistent data that the body weight changes correlate directly with increasing or decreasing intake of sugars. Look at this, church. Just by decreasing 5% of sugar intake, individuals witnessed to lose an average of 0.8 kilograms of their body weights. And by increasing sugar in, uh, intake by 5%, individuals seem to gain an average of 0.75 kilograms. If you are looking to lose weight, and for those of us who are always struggling with it, I am learning that there are two key things you have to remove from your diet. One of them is added sugar, processed sugar, white sugar, white bread, white rice, white potatoes. Move all of that stuff out and replace it with whole brown rice, whole grain breads like Ezekiel 49 bread. Um, um, and take out the white sugar. If you're gonna use, if you have to use sugar, use date sugar, which is which is actually ground up whole date, so the fiber is still in there. The other problem with sugar is when you process it like you do, you remove all the fiber. The, without fiber, it doesn't bulk. It's immediately absorbed into your bloodstream, sends insulin levels super high. When it when, And as soon as your insulin stores, it gets rid of all that sugar, much of it's going to go into your fat cells. Then your insulin, your sugar levels crash and you're hungry all over again. And it's a repeating cycle. Um, so you can see here that by getting rid of sugar. But the other thing you got to get out of your diet is processed oils. Remember, we talked about fat and sugar together is the most damaging. Well, that's what a potato chip is. That's what a French fry is. And all the oil, even olive oil, even coconut oil, all the oils we say are good for you, they are high in calories and they're highly processed, stripped from the natural environment of how God made them. In nature, fructose is never unbound to fiber. Let me say that again. In nature, fructose is never unbound to fiber. Sugar is never all by itself except in honey. And even then, God had bees guard the honey. So we are not designed by God to eat all of this processed sugar. And that's why we're so sick. That's why we can't lose weight. It's why we're getting cancers. Um, and then you throw in the massive intake of meat and cheese and dairy, and it starts to really make sense. So how are we getting all of this sugar? Although the average consumption of soft drinks have decreased to a new low in the year 2015, many people have increased their consumption of energy drinks, which now make up more than 10% of the American soft drink industry. A 20-ounce can of Coke contains about 16 teaspoons of high fructose corn syrup in comparison. The average 20 ounce of energy drink is 54 to 62 grams of high fructose corn syrup. Uh, there are more than 29 billion gallons consumed in the United States in 2016. Um, and this is where all the added sugar comes from. Soda, energy, sports drinks, 42.2%. If there's one thing you want to do to protect your body temple, it would be to cut out this first one. Then it's grain-based desserts, cakes, cookies. They are full of sugar and really bad. Fruit drinks. So if you add the, these two together and you got rid of fruit drinks, and I know I, I like fruit drinks. I like pineapple juice and orange juice, but it's again, it's stripped of its of its fiber. Um, and even if you put it through a blender or a, a Vitamix, it does beat up a lot of the fiber in there as well, but at least it's still there. So it's better to make a smoothie, 
add um, um, you know uh, almond milk and fruits and, and drink that rather than because that's going to hold you and be much more filling. Dairy desserts like ice cream, candy, ready to eat cereals, sugar, straight tea, yeast breads, syrups, and toppings. So you can see we get sugar from all kinds of places. And here's the sweet life and what it costs us. So sugar high. So what is what does the sweet life actually cost us? Let me make this bigger since I'm in this mood. Um, on average, Americans consume 100 pounds of sugar and sweeteners each year, or almost 30 teaspoons on average every single day. That is staggering, because you're going to say, where in the world do I get that from? Nearly half of that comes from soda and fruit drinks. These drinks are the number one source of calories in the American diet. And so you, if you wouldn't eat 17 packs of sugar, let me make this one bigger. If you wouldn't eat 17 packs of sugar, why would you drink them? They're in the top five calorie sources are sweetened beverages, grain-based desserts, yeast breads, chicken dishes. Why chicken dishes? Well, there's a lot of calories in chicken because they fry it, but then they don't just fry it, they bread it. And so you, what is in the bread? It's white flour. You just get sugar again. Same with pizza. Pizza is the most addictive food um, known to man, and it's because the fat in the cheese, the fat in the meat, um, the sugar in the crust, uh, they even stick cheese in the crust nowadays. Didn't do that when I was a kid. Um, and cheese itself, when it's not, I know we're not talking about cheese today, has case of morphones in it, which are related to like heroin. It's an opiate type substance in cheese that is designed to make the calf really like drinking the, its mother's milk. So it keeps going back for milk when it's hungry. But when we get it, it's a very low dose compared to like heroin, but it does make it so the cheese is very difficult to give up. And you add that to sugar, like in the pizza crust, and it's a wrap. Um, so let me see if I can make this more readable here. Um, well, I'll skip that one because I would have to fix it. Um, and I, I want to end with just, just these two slides just to make the point and then we'll take some questions. You see this? This is means that sugar really can create pleasure and can function like an addictive substance like cocaine and its effects on the brain. And this is why, you know, we got to tell the truth about sugar. Um, we don't have time to get into diabetes, cancer, and some of the other things that we could talk about with sugar. This is Kind of a primer, but I think you get a, the gist that really, if you want to be healthy, one of the things you got to give up is processed sugar um, in foods. When we go to restaurants, they put it in everything, along with salt. And the and the deadly, the you know the, the evil trinity of, of the American diet is salt, sugar, and fat. And when you go out to a restaurant, they load it with those three things because it makes it palatable, and it also makes it preserve. It stays, um, and so that's why we've got to get rid of all those things and. We're done with the slides, so we can we can talk for the rest of the time we have. Oh, yes, we have a short time and a ton of questions. My goodness, I will take Frances Parker first because I'm with her. She says, this is painful truth. So good, yet can be devastated. I am devastated. I had two donuts on Friday, <laughs> and I thought I was doing okay because I, you know, the calorie count, right? And I didn't have any other food, so... According to your talk, it was the worst thing possible on planet Earth. <laughs> well, don't beat yourself up. We've been all, again, you know, you know, listen, God shows us great mercy for a reason. That we live in a sinful world. And it's not that this happened by accident. There are people who are working to get us to like these foods and think we need these foods. They're yeah. paid to do that. So it's not like it's just your willpower. You have to have awareness. And then we have to work together to really beat it because it is hard to beat. Um yeah. Um, there's something you said I was, I was gonna comment on, but um, you know, so it is difficult to to overcome these things, but it's not impossible. Um, yeah. and that's one of the things we gotta focus on. Oh, thank you for the encouragement. So let's start with the questions. And Judy on Bailey, let me have you go ahead and clarify your question there on juicing once a week, whether you mean uh juicing fruit or vegetables, and then I will come right back to you. So let's start with Maria uh Thorne. We want to thank everybody for just jumping in uh, with the questions. I think she had a question early on here. Um, here it is. So Dr. Walsh, why is it after a meal, we want to eat something sweet? A lot of times it's because one, we've been trained to do it. We were given desserts when we were kids after we ate a meal. Um, and so we we're used to it. Um, sometimes it's because we're not waiting long enough for the food to get far enough down in our digestive tract. It takes about 20 minutes for um, the peptide YY uh, to be released in the, the intestines to tell our brain that we're full. Um, and so, you know, it, you know, I can guarantee you that there are whole civilizations that lived and never, 
never had a donut after they ate a meal or a piece of cake. So it's something that we're kind of conditioned for. I saw someone else asking the question, can we, should we, you know, what about taking um, uh, like a piece of fruit after a meal? And that's okay. Just remember that fruit digests faster than the other food. So there are a lot of people who argue you do that, the fruit is actually going to sit longer and ferment in you and fruit are really good to eat by themselves. They do digest very quickly. So if you have to have a late meal, the best late meal I honestly have, is a, that's when it's good to have fruits, actually, because they'll digest faster before you go to bed. Oh, good to know. Can you comment on sugar and chemotherapy? Should persons uh, going through chemo or cancer have any type of sugar? I would say they should absolutely not. Sugar feeds cancer cells. So if you want to beat cancer, one of the best things you could do is actually give up sugar. Um, and eat whole food. So if you want to eat sugar, you can eat a mango. That's perfect. Nothing I'm saying talks about is not. It's talking about fruit. You can cut up mango, cantaloupes, watermelon, and eat it, and you're gonna be better off than you would have been without it. But if you take it in, you know, Snickers and Twinkies and honey buns and all that kind of stuff, it actually gonna feed your cancer and make it worse. Would that include the the ones that you were talking about, the white flowers, the white breads? Uh... All that just breaks down to sugar. Um, you know, all of that just becomes sucro. You know, it just becomes the same thing we're trying to get away from. Starches. So if you go to, you know, my family's from Jamaica, beautiful island of Jamaica. And even here, in, if you go down into the south in the States, yams, potatoes, Jamaica said, talk about like dashing and cocoa. Um, you know, there's a lot of root foods. Those foods are not like sugar. Those are full of um, um, starches and fibers. Um, soluble and insoluble fibers that are actually very good for you and actually help you lose weight. But when you eat them processed, so you process these things, that's when you get the problems or deep fry them in a table, in a, in a um, tea, tablespoon of oils. So we're asking about somebody put in there about is avocado oil good avocado. or is this kind of oil good? That kind of oil. All oil is 120 calories in a tablespoon. So I want you to think about what that means when you drop a piece of chicken into a boiling vat of oil, or you drop potatoes into a boiling vat of oil. A whole potato is 70 calories to 100 calories. You drop it in the oil and it absorbs three tablespoons of oil. You just added 360 calories to it, and it will not satiate you any more than it would have without it, which is oh. why we say cut the oils out of your diet. Oh, wow. And here we have another question from Stefan Abenez. Um, are sugar substitutes okay? For instance, Pepsi Zero and Zero Carbs. No. In general, I actually uh, um, really advise against it. Um, as aspartame, one of the most popular ones, um, was not even approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, some argue that what happened is it was, wasn't was until um, Donald Rumsfeld got into the White House with George W. Bush and he, he owns shares in that company and pushed it through. Um, so you can go and look that up if you want to. But aspartame was never supposed to be consumed by humans. So you definitely don't want to take that into your body at all. Um, and many of the other ones, it's actually very similar. The studies show that when you use sub sugar substitutes, you actually consume more calories. It does not cause weight gain. People actually eat more because the brain is thinking it's, it's tasting something sweet, thinking it's going to get glucose at some point for energy. It never shows up. So the brain says, hey, I need more, 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 more. It affects the way your insulin is processed. Not very good for you. Stevia, some people argue, is the best one. I would say date sugar is the best one um, because it is, like I said, a whole fruit. They grind up to make a sugar out of it. Um, and that's why it's sweet. And that's why it's better because we still have the fiber and all the nutrients. Wow, that is powerful. And here we have- uh, and you can order date sugar online. Sorry, somebody put that in the chat. You can order date sugar online. You just got to look at it. I think Amazon will ship it to you. Oh, okay. That's great. And then the, the follow-up question, what about agave syrup? Uh, same thing. Some of those, uh, you know, I, I am not a fan of any of those, the, the, the sweeteners, because a lot of them are high in fructose, and I think agave is. Um, and so some of them are best. So molasses is still just sugar. But it does at least have some of the minerals and vitamins in it that white sugar won't have. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, you could argue if you're going to use the sugar, it's better. And agave would fall in that category. But if you're really trying to manage diabetes, keep your immune system straight, avoid cancer, you would actually avoid all of those sweeteners. And the only one, like I said, is date sugars that you use. And whole dates. I mean, if you make desserts and you put dates in it, dates are sweet naturally. And you can eat them and have a good dessert. Oh, excellent. And so Judy Ann Bailey, her question here is, um, uh oh, what about juicing once a week? And she's talking about fruits and vegetables. I think if you do that once a week, that's fine. Um, I've done juice fast before and stuff. 
Um, I, I think what you and that's a different kind of juice than when you look at like apple juice in a bottle, because um, you're going to put stuff in it that isn't very high in sugar, like celery and spinach. Um, you know, so it's a little bit of a different thing. Now, if you just if you just put in pure fruits and do the juice fast, like I like I, I I've learned that it was really much easier to do the juice fast. It was a lot of apples and oranges and pineapples in there, right. stripping all the fiber, pulling all the sugar loose, and drinking it. So if you're not really heavy with the greens, you're not you may not really be doing yourself much of a favor um, doing it that way. You will get some of the antioxidants and stuff, but you're um, it's still gonna mess up your liver and cause the problems that we talked about. So then you're recommending that if we're going to juice is heavily vegetable based with few fruits and it, can that be daily or just the once a week? That could be daily. I mean, if, you, if it's, if it's 70% spinach, you know, uh, celery, you know, kale, if it's mostly green vegetables mm -hmm. um, with a little bit of fruit to sweeten it so you can tolerate it, that's very different than what most of us would do, which is it'd be like 80% fruit. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> that's what I would do. <laughs> and then here we have a question about, um, oh, what can we do to overcome the cravings of eating a sweet food after a meal? That's a good question. I, I think if you really wanna do that, that's where learning to make some healthy, whole food, plant-based desserts comes into play. Um, so some people will just have, if they really have to have it, they have to get, you know, they'll eat, they'll eat some fruits after a piece of watermelon, some dates, whatever. Um, but I would argue, um, you know, you can actually take tofu and make some really, you know, relatively healthy desserts without any added sugar. That's low in calorie, actually, uh, and with fruit. And that can be good. So if you really want to do that, you can do that. If not, I would argue you should also make sure that the meal is satisfying and made of whole grains. Um and, and healthy foods, because that naturally will bring out cravings as well. Right. I, I, had, I had understood that sometimes if you're low on your minerals, you're not eating enough vegetables, then you get a sugar craving. Is yeah, that because correct? Your, because your body's trying to tell you, hey, I'm missing something. I'm missing something. I'm missing something. And you, because before, prop, before there was Nabisco and processed food factories and food chemists and food engineers, if you had a craving for something like that, you'd have to go out into the bush and pick a fruit, you'd go out to the bush and, you know, you'd go and pick healthy food to eat. Um, you couldn't go and pick up a Twinkie. Um, so, it, you know, your, that desire for sweet is put in us because sweet fruits are high in, highly antioxidant, you know, dark grapes, blueberries, um, they're really good for us, mangoes. Um, but when you process, so you, you can basically hijack that natural craving by taking the sugar out of the fruit or in the, in the case of the, you know, usually sugar cane, and putting it into flour, <laughs> sweetening up the flour, and then giving it to you as a cake, and it's, there's no nutritional value. It's yeah. so it's calorie dense, nutritionally sparse, and the reason. And then they add egg and milk and fat, and you just do the math. And it literally, it's like we're eating ourselves to death. Oh my goodness! And then we have another question from Maria Thorne. Uh, she says, "Dr. Walsh, does the food that turns into sugar?" have the same effect as added sugar? And can you name some of the foods that turns into sugar? So it, it ultimately will have the same effects or similar. So uh, that's like white bread, like Wonder Bread, white bread. It just, there's no nutritional value, stripped of all of its fiber, stripped of all of its, then they enrich it. So they say enriched white bread. So they put mm -hmm. back six or seven things into it. That's not what you want. You want the whole grain. So somebody asked what a whole grain food do you suggest? All of them. So whole grain wheat, whole grain barley, whole yams, whole all those whole foods. Um, so, you know, the Ezekiel 4-9 bread is a good bread company. There are others that are whole, truly whole grain. Ezekiel 4-9 is also sprouted, so there's more of a nutritional release. Um, so those, that, that I would definitely recommend. Uh, but when you talk about whole grain foods, we're talking about whole brown rice, not, you know, not stripped into white rice. We're talking about whole ground flours that they didn't take anything from the wheat. They made the out of it. They made the wheat, um, the pasta out of the wheat um, that is whole. It's, it's a, it's different. Sometimes the people say it's harder to cook, but that's part of the reason why it's better for you. It's more complicated. It means it takes more for you to break it down, and so it's going to be a lot better for you. Um, and somebody put in, what about sprouted bread? I mentioned Ezekiel four nine is a sprouted bread, and I, that's a that's a good bread to eat. Excellent, excellent. And I think you had uh, K Arc Rebuild had asked what whole grain foods do you suggest. So I think those are the ones that you were stating yeah. there. 
um, with the whole food. So that's whole breakfast cereals with no added sugars. Um, that, that's really how you want to eat. You make cereal in the morning, whether it's whole, like uh, steel cut oats is a good whole food, um, whole grain, steel cut oats. You want to put blueberries in it, bananas, strawberries, mm -hmm. dates to make it sweet, a little bit of unsweetened almond milk. You can learn to eat that. That's going to really do you good because the way I grew up and probably most of you grew up, it was Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Added, we added sugar to it. We, then we put bananas in it and we ate it yes. with cow's milk. So yeah. we were raised to really be eating foods that just weren't good for us. Um, and now the science proves that our health message was right from the beginning. Yes. Oh, Dr. Walsh, it has been enlightening this talk. And yes, we have to have you back again for part two so that we can dive even deeper into the sugar because this has been, for me, halfway devastating, but encouraging at the same time. Um, but I wanted to say some takeaways that you said that I don't want anybody to miss, to forget. I mean, we can go back and watch it again. Definitely share on all your social medias, your Facebook pages, YouTube, Twitter, all the like. But this one you said, the truth about sugar is that it changes your brain and requires more for the same pleasure. So I, I thought that was excellent. And then you said anything that changes your mood can be addictive. The most uh, significant one that I remember is that you said your body will conspire, conspire to kill you. Those are those cravings that we get, that we want to eat more and more sugar, oil, fried foods, all the like, but our bodies will conspire to kill us. Dr. Wash, thank you so much for this presentation. We surely will have you back again for part two on sugar. And we wanna thank everybody that joined us. The chat was busy, it was alive, full of questions. We thank you all so much for being with us. Any parting words for us, Dr. Walsh? My parting words is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Excellent. Um, and the reason, you know, Paul speaks of having a thorn in the flesh in the Corinthians. And we all have to remember that these things happen. You know, we get these difficult habits to break. They should humble us, remind us of our need for Christ. Um, and if they do that, um, they can serve two purposes. Not only do you beat the habit and he get healthier, but you become closer to your Lord. And ultimately, yeah. that is what we're after. Yes. Thank you so much. Let's pray out. Father God, thank you so much for bringing Dr. Walsh to speak to us on this topic. Thank you for having him remind us that we can do all things through you that strengthens us. So when we feel like this has been overwhelming, we can take it step by step, Lord. You have provided us with your grace and your mercy. So remind us of this every day that we can truly do all things through you who strengthens us one step at a time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right, bye everyone.